Government and capitalism are two sides of the same coin. Nobody is arguing that modern-day governments don't need capitalism. A government can't function without the precious tax revenue that capitalism affords. On the other hand, I would argue that capitalism needs government. Capitalism without government, i.e. the free market, is like an out-of-control steam train hurtling down the line. The goal is to reach its destination as fast as possible. Without regulation, the train will eventually come to a curve in the track and derail, killing and maiming many of its occupants. The government are the engineers, the train operators, the railway signals. They are vital in keeping the train and its passengers safe. Capitalists would argue that if only the government would stand aside and let the free market take the reins, everything would be okay. But clearly, that would end in disaster. Between 1936 and 1969, the Cuyahoga River in northeast Ohio caught fire numerous times due to the large amount of pollution caused by industrial waste. The free market did nothing to clean it up. It required the government to intervene and impose a $1.5 billion cleanup fee. This ultimately led to the creation of the United States Clean Water Act. If it wasn't for regulation, one must wonder what would happen to Australia's national parks. Would logging companies mosey on in and clear entire sections of forests just to make a few extra bucks? Probably. I've done a little bit of a case study over the last couple of years regarding a massive shopping centre redevelopment occurring right here in my little city of Toowoomba. This shopping centre could be described as a microcosm of the free market in action. The redevelopment doubled the size of the shopping centre to approximately 90,000 square metres. For Toowoomba, that's huge. They had to knock down an old shopping centre in the process, one that was still in pretty good condition. But that's not how capitalism works, right? Out with the old, in with the new. The new centre was touted as bringing lots of benefits to the region. 1,500 jobs created in the construction process with a local employment of 75%. 1,000 more retail jobs available once stores start trading. Melbourne-like shopping, lifestyle and entertainment destination. Australian and international high-end brands in standalone stores. But the centre has had a devastating effect on the city centre. If you walk down the CBD, you'll see what I mean. Large amounts of shops lay empty, four lease signs are posted everywhere. Within the new part of the shopping centre, there's a central avenue which contains mainly high-end fashion shops. They're selling goods that the average person can't afford. Their workers just stand around hoping for the next customer. Are these shops successful? No. Are their stores empty? Yes. Are those workers contributing greatly to society? No. They're just there for the paycheck. Most of these shops currently have 70% off because they can't sell any of their goods for full price. The owners not only have to pay back their business loans, they have to fork out the exorbitant shopping centre rent every month. Does the shopping centre give them a bit of respite if they are struggling to pay their rent? Of course not. The shopping centre is not in the business of giving people free rent. Eventually, all of these shop owners will either end up in massive debt or bankrupt. They've probably signed five-year leases, so are legally powerless to do anything except try to make ends meet. The free market has failed them. Debt has fueled this crisis. Banks are giving out loans to anyone with a business plan. My wife used to work in the centre for an Asian restaurant. They were consistently underpaying her, so I kicked up a stink. I went down to see the owner and he went into a rage, threatening me and my family. I reported him to the centre management. Did they intervene? No. Did they care about the individual workers? Barely. All they cared about was that the owner was paying his rent. They didn't care if he cheated his staff. Admittedly, they did advise my wife to contact the federal government's Fair Work Ombudsman, but she wasn't willing to do that. She felt threatened by the owner and thought it easier just to cut her losses and move on. I wasn't going to force her to do something she didn't want to do. I've seen this sort of exploitation time and time again at the new centre. Multiple massage parlours, nail shops, as in manicures and the like, and stores selling mobile phone accessories have sprung up everywhere. How many massage parlours does one centre need? All of these types of stores employ workers who don't know their rights. The owners knowingly exploit their staff. My wife's friend, a stay-at-home mum, recently got a part-time job in the new centre working for one of these new massage parlours as a receptionist. The boss told her that he would provide free training for the first two weeks. That is, he wouldn't pay her for the first two weeks. How nice of him. She accepted, as her English is not very good, and it would be hard for her to find a job elsewhere. Two weeks went past, and she was hoping that she would start getting a paycheck. But of course, nothing eventuated. She didn't want to rock the boat, so she kept quiet for another week. A total of three weeks had passed, and still no word from the boss regarding her pay. 
My wife recommended that she contact the boss directly. Maybe he had forgotten. Eventually, she built up the courage to ring him and told him that she had finished her training and was quite comfortable managing reception. But the boss disagreed. He said that she was still making mistakes and needed a couple of more weeks' practice. How he knew this, I don't know. I'd say he was just making it up to squeeze out a few more weeks of free labour. To cut a long story short, she ended up staying there for about seven or eight weeks in total. Did she see any money? No. Will she make a complaint about the owner? No. She feels that making a complaint would only hurt her. The owner knows her name and address and could easily make her life difficult if she went around complaining about him. Even if she did make a formal complaint to the centre management, as seen with my wife's example, they wouldn't do anything except advise her to contact the federal government. The owner of the massage parlour probably went out and hired another unsuspecting student or housewife and put them on permanent training. I thought slavery had been abolished. I've got dozens of other stories similar to this one, but nothing ever gets done about it. Owners treat their employees as badly as they can get away with. Although we are living in rules-regulated Australia, within these shopping centres, owners have found a way to exploit their workers. The free market at its best. debt fueled capitalism has allowed these unnecessary shops, and therefore jobs, to exist. Don't fall into the trap of separating government from capitalism. They're one of the same thing. Governments allow banks to lend out to individuals and get them into massive debt, just to keep the economy plodding along. If there was no regulation, banks would probably lend out even more money, getting us into even greater mess. There are no truly free market societies, nor should there be. Free markets result in exploitation and environmental damage. The tragedy of the commons is a very real thing. On the other hand, too much government control results in overregulation and unwanted bureaucracy grinding the economy to a halt. There's a fine balancing act required to keep this fragile system ticking along. In my opinion, there is only one diagnosis for the current state of society debt fueled end stage capitalism. If we keep going the way we're going, ultimately capitalism, or the government, or both, are going to collapse.